This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the church. We're going to make it get on. Welcome to the best hour or so in the universe. It's Reasonable Doubt. I'm Adam Carolla. That's Mark Garrigus in New York City. In New York City, right? For those who don't know, who don't follow closely, you see that giant gold 12 behind Adam? Mm-hmm. That is not for McAllen 12, but it's for Corolla 12. Because 12 years of podcasting, 3,000 podcast episodes. Is that right, Adam Corolla? 3,000 and counting in uh, 12 years and uh, still going strong. So uh, thank you for that. I, I, I um, you know, I like to measure... Uh, time periods in terms of single malt scotch so (laughs) this is a mac 12 i can hardly wait for your mac 18 and you and i are going to disappear on your mac 25 (laughs) we will be gone for like two weeks all right well i'm excited to talk to you today because there's been some recent uh news about tin horn flats Uh, tin horn flats is a kind of honky tonk kind of place uh sonny and i visited uh few few weeks few months back um i know the owner from uh, high school armo so right. uh we and by the way yes. by the way the let me give you a couple of fun facts there was a city council hearing burbank city council where they now uh want to revoke their conditional use permit there one of the things that came out during this many hour Um, proceeding was that they were very irate that you, Adam Carolla, had the unmitigated gall to talk about Tin Horn Flats. That was, they've kind of targeted the, there's a Corolla harassment element of this. Did you know that? Well, I would say to the Burbank City Council, get in line, bitches, because uh, (laughs) you already got the teachers unions in front of you and most of Hollywood. So kiss my ass, number one. (laughs) I do love this new world order where imbeciles that make $63,000 a year and have never run a business and don't know jack squat about how anything works can somehow tell the successful people who keep the lights on in this goddamn city their business. And we're supposed to listen. I've been to the DMV. I've, I've seen I've been to the airport. I've seen security. I've seen who you people are. If you knew what you were doing, you'd be in the private sector. So we're not listening to you dingbats. I, this is going to, I don't know. Gary and I um, curated a, just a, a, about a, how long is it, Gary? About a minute 20? Yeah, just about. Well, let, let's set the table a little bit yeah, more before we go into please it. Do. So Because t- you know what's going to happen. Your head is going to, you're going to go from zero to 120 when you see this, because I don't think you've seen this yet. Tin Horn Flats, as the crow flies, is about a mile and a quarter from where I'm sitting. The guy who owns it and runs it with his family and his kids is a guy I graduated with at North Hollywood High in 1982 um i found out that they were staying open and defying the outdoor dining lockdown order which to this day no one has been able to produce any evidence that would suggest that that was a dangerous way to serve food or that there was any spread that way and uh Uh, let me just do a commentary not only is there no evidence no data and unequivocally county health and the state health director have admitted there's no evidence it actually there is a compelling case to be made that it actually doubled down and exacerbated the problem by forcing people to go indoors right so i took uh, barrett lepagian as the name of the gentleman who i went to high school with so who runs it so i took my son there to eat outdoors during the outdoor dining lockdown. Now, in a different America, they would have said that would have been a nice story. If if you're making a movie, you'd go, this guy went to high school with this guy, was friends with this guy in high school. Then his business was being closed down by the uh, evil city of Burbank. So this guy took his son as an act of defiance to go there and eat outdoors. That's uh, that's a story that you would tell if that was a movie. I would be the goddamn hero in that movie, and Burbank would be the villain, especially right. since now Sonny's clinging to life in an ICU because uh, we had a burger outdoors. But um, 
that was their beef. Now, again, the insidious part of this is our loyal subjects have defied us, and thus they must be punished to set an example for any other citizen who uh, attempts to defy us. And whatever our decrees are, no matter how bizarre or how unprovable they are or how little they lack research or science, you defy us, you shall be punished and made an example of. So now Burbank, the city of Burbank, is going after. Now, obviously, the restaurants that are to the right and to the left of Tin Horn Flats that did obey and did cancel the outdoor dining, they're now back up and running and out with outdoor dining. So really, the city of Burbank owes them an apology. They basically owe all the restaurants that were closed down an apology for needlessly closing down outdoor dining. But they're not going to do that. They're going to go after the place that defied them. And by the way, um, let me also kind of add another um, it's kind of set the table. The argument that the city of Burbank has made is that the violations were of the LA County health permit. Well, the LA County health permit was issued and a superior court judge found that it was not only unconstitutional, but arbitrary and capricious. They had no basis for it whatsoever. And that was before the county suspended their health permit. Now, mind you, you would think in the face of the city of Burbank would say, well, let's press pause, let that litigation go on, or maybe, well, let's hear what happened about that. No, no, no. They have decided they're going to double or triple down. We're now going to revoke their conditional use permit. And Alexandra, a lawyer in the office, attended the hearing, and Gary, I think, has now excised a particular clip. What is the guy's name who uh, takes center stage? This What is the failed actor uh, <laughs> city council member's uh, name? Yes, it's Councilman Constantine Anthony. And just to give a little bit more context, this is at the tail end of the meeting that is all about Tin Horn Flats that went on for well over four hours. And I have four watched, hours was spent on this. I've okay? watched a large portion of it, and it is pretty maddening. It's uh, yeah, but this particular clip, uh, I think, is especially egregious. So we will highlight it here, and I'm going to play it for you guys right now. And by the way, zero transmission in terms of cases produced by yes. the outdoor dining of Tin Horn Flats. Uh, you could factor that in. Well, right. zero yeah. transmission, and look, I have been in. The courts and filings, the one case that has ever been cited in all of the litigation I've done is an apocryphal story in Wuhan by some guy who says he got it outdoors talking to somebody. That's the one case that's actually mentioned in their paperwork after judges have given them time after time after time to come up with a study or any other data. That's it. Let's listen to the clip. The idea that the health of this and this, the, the science is debatable and simply because there's a debate, we can throw out all of these orders. That is ludicrous. That is not the way you run society or government. You do the best you can. You get the smartest people in the room. You take a democratic vote and you pass laws and ordinances. And if they're wrong, they get changed. And if they're unconstitutional, they get thrown out in court. But you take them as they come and you follow the law as it is. You know, Rosa Parks actually had to sit in jail after she was taken off the bus. (laughs) She did her time. I mean, granted, she did change the law. The the courts came down and ruled in her favor, but she still had to pay the penance for violating a lawful order at the time. It was a lawful order at the time. So we have to look at the time and the dates that we have before us. 
Adolf Hitler was uh, admired by many of his countrymen at the time. At the time. At the time. Let me explain something, just how ludicrous and idiotic this human is. First of all, it wasn't a lawful order. That was the whole point. The order was not lawful. Number one, it wasn't lawful because the governor and the county have not gone through the Administrative Procedures Act. What they have done is they've given an unelected bureaucrat who is not a doctor by the name of Barbara Farrar the authority to do issue these orders. They did it originally under an emergency order. That emergency order has long since passed. There is no lawful order. That's what a county judge, superior court judge found. The court of appeal is, we've already done the oral arguments. They are trying to decide this or wrestling with this right now. Everything he just said is factually, legally, and just common sense wrong. It's ludicrous. And by the way, if you're going to invoke Rosa Parks, at least do it correctly. Rosa Parks wasn't, vi- I mean, the, the Rosa Parks analogy, as you said, that's basically this guy trying to turn her into the Nuremberg defense. It's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Well, also, I don't know, in a day and age where everyone is getting canceled for everything, <laughs> explaining that uh, we did the right thing by taking Rosa Parks and disciplining her seems pretty egregious in this particular political climate. Uh, there, there... I I don't understand. Like, yeah, it was okay. You should have thrown. Is what he's saying is it was okay for Rosa Parks to be prosecuted and go to jail? That yes. she had to pay the penance because it was a lawful order? What is he talking about? What? Why does this pontificating blowhard, why would the people in the city of Burbank um, vote? I mean, this guy was elected and if he was elected, why hasn't he been recalled? Um, it would be nice, but also from a just purely humanistic standpoint, just forget about titles and elections and tin horn flats in the city of Burbank. This guy seems like an unmitigated imbecile. This guy just he he may be dumber than Gavin Newsom. Move over, Gavin. There's a new sheriff in the idiot department. And his name is, what, Constantine Anthony. So, first off, his logic. Could you imagine this guy in court? <laughs> what, what if this guy was a lawyer that you had to square off against and he started his opening statement with that Rosa Parks analogy? It would be the shortest work day of your life. The I wouldn't even get to speak. I could just picture the judge. Mr. Garrigus, sit down. I'm, I got this. I got this. I mean, it, it's... Uh, mind-boggling. And by the way, where is the city attorney? I, I, what, what, why do you let these people say these things that are just open to uh, scrutiny of even a eighth grade civics level that you know are wrong? What lawful order is he talking about? I, I, that was the whole argument that was being made, that it wasn't a lawful order. So where does it stand now? What's the current status? I, my understanding is, is that they're open, and if they want to shut them down, they're going to have to sue. So, you know, they want to sue. Then guess what? Then we go to court. Then guess what? Alex will, I'm sure, get the, this particular um, Einstein or uh, civil rights um, maven <laughs> under oath in a deposition, and we'll have him explain himself. Uh, I mean, it really, it's really astonishing. It's, there's a Lord of the Flies element to all of this, um, uh, if you will, because these, the, I, if you read some of the comments, most people are sensible and realize just how absurd this is. But the people who come and support this, the zero follower Twitterites who are like, yeah, he's infected people and they're, they're in the ICUs and he's causing death and destruction. I mean, it's like, what? I, uh, how the, the zigzag of, um, of logic is astonishing to watch. Um, where are we with indoor dining? Now, the outdoor dining I, I'm still surprised that indoor dining, indoor dining in uh, California or Los Angeles is still shut down. It's coming back to California. Orange County very shortly. It's coming back to Orange County. They, I, they're guess what state? The only state in our United States of America. There's only one state 
that does not have indoor dining. By the way, that would be also the worst state uh, in corona deaths, corona infections. They're one and the same. There's a Venn diagram, and they perfectly fit one over the other. California. I also heard that California was the last state to not have gyms reopen. <laughs> so. Correct. Correct. I, it's it's I, wait, what's the one thing that seems to correlate both internationally and amongst the states um, and bad outcomes on COVID is metabolic syndrome, pre-existing right. conditions. That was the one thing that, you know, I called it uh, since day one, the Vinny virus. Mm-hmm. Um, why does Japan have such better outcomes than we do? You know, I mean, it isn't, it isn't because they're doing anything differently, except the people are leaner, less obese, and have less pre-existing conditions. I wonder why that is. You, you, so let's close down the gyms, leave the drive through fast food places open, right? Right. Shut down health places where you can get healthy options to eat and make sure that you can't work out. That's a good solution, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, with that, I had a theory that I was putting together earlier this week that I'd like to float and you put on your lawyer hat that you never really take off. So I don't have to ask you to don it. But uh, I was thinking... All this talk about how this is affecting Europe, getting lots of, well, lots of, the COVID thing's been a lot of United States, then a lot of California and a lot of Florida, and then a lot of Europe, a lot of uh, Western Europe, lots of discussion about that. Um, But I was like, this is the one pandemic where Africa is just on the sideline. I'm not hearing anything about Africa. Now, if you really think about it, you take something like AIDS. AIDS was all about Africa. It was nonstop. You know, we we talked about it here in the United States, but almost immediately shifted to Africa and what's going on and how they're being decimated by AIDS and how can we help them. And usually when the shit goes down, it takes us about 10 minutes in the news cycle to shift to Africa. What's going on in Africa? No stories about what's going on in Africa, which is interesting because if you just sort of go in the Wayback Machine and you picture watching CNN and the, here's what's, you know, Germany's having an outbreak and Sweden's not locking down. What's going to happen with Sweden and Italy's having a spike? Z- almost zero Africa talk. If you think about, I, it. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting you say that because I did see an article this morning that was comparing excess deaths, and they had a chart because a lot of people have taken the position that excess deaths is the way to judge historically pandemics. You can see you take a trailing four years of what the 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 deaths are in a particular country, and then if you spike you then understand that the the pandemic is having that effect. And it's fascinating you say that because they had every Western European country, United States there, but they did not have Africa in the bar graph. And that is interesting to me. Well, Africa has, I think, uh, I don't know, 1.2 billion people in it. So there's a lot of people. And we're also constantly beating this drum of how this is disproportionately affecting the African-American community. So there is a place called Africa where everyone is African. So maybe we should check it out. So I was thinking to myself, well, why no news out of Africa? And the first thought was, well, good news is no news. So they must not be decimated because if they were decimated, we would be hearing about it, the politicians and the CNNs and everywhere else. So they're evidently doing pretty well over there. But then why? They're, they're impoverished. You know, we, we're, we constantly talk about how this is connected to poverty and income and stuff like that. Well, there's and how it's affecting the black community. Well, plenty of impoverished black people there doesn't seem to have, have had the effect that we have here. So why is that? How come we don't hear anything about that? And I started scratching around a little on it. Um, One of the themes that they were 
essentially hiding from us since uh, Jump Street on this was the age, how it affected old people and didn't affect young people. We didn't like that message of how it didn't affect young people because we wanted general overall panic. And you don't create general overall panic by saying it happens to 86-year-olds in a nursing home in Boca Raton. So first thing I found out is the average age of the person in Africa was 19 and change. Whereas, you know, we're like, I don't know, 37 or something like that. So A, having a bunch, a a young populace is definitely going to hurt this disease in terms of death toll. I mean, in a, in a big way. Uh, So they didn't really want to report that part of it. Yeah, we're 38 and they're 19. I mean, we're we're literally double. And what is what is the I I confess to not knowing because and I read quite a bit on this. What do we know what the rate is and where Africa ranks? We don't know. I I don't know much other than Cuz that's interesting cuz just this morning I was reading about Scandinavia, Western Europe, um Japan, and the, like I say, the bar graph I saw and the excess debt um, uh, charts. And it's interesting that that's not in there. You know, the problem is for places like Russia, do you believe the statistics come out of there? I mean, given the fact that they, what they do with their dissidents, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe anything that comes out of Russia. But um, I, I would be very, here we go, Americas, here we go, by who? WHO, wow. World Health Organization numbers. This is where I, I've pulled this off their website. So are wow. those deaths? No, no. 40 so, to 9 million? No, those are cases. So we have 50 million cases, and Africa has under 3 million cases, and our population is four times as big, or three and a half times as no, big. No, our, our correct? population is, is much smaller, actually. We have 330 million in Africa. The continent, like the entire continent, is like one2 one four billion. Oh, oh. So they have three times as many people and they have three million cases as So they're to under million. they're under a three percent case, right? I believe Maybe they're even less. Yeah, I, I think even less than that. Wait, so yeah. they have three and a half they are three and a half times larger than us? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you got out of the game. Three and a half no, times really larger not. and they've got Jesus, what, 50, basically 50 to 3 in terms of the ratio, yeah. which is unbelievable. Well, we're at 50 and million so, and they're at 2.8. I mean, yeah, that's a that's big, unbelievable. That's a well, big you know, age is one thing, but I'm not I, done with but, my but, hypotheses. OK, I, I'm going to throw one thing in here, fit it into your hypotheses. Japan. What's Japan's average age? Oh, they're the oldest. Well, that's what I so, think. Japan, they also- Japan is the oldest nation. I do believe I've I've heard that a few times. So they are amongst the oldest. So, but they're fit to back up your Vinny hypotheses. I'm telling you, the Vinny hypothesis to me is the one that seems to fit. Uh, You know, I always say, and I stole it from my professor in college, uh, any theory is only 80 percent good. It only covers 80 percent of the data. But keep going. I want to I want to hear the median age in uh, Japan is 48 plus 48 and four year four months. Where's the does who break out Japan? I saw that it just had um, it looks like the WHO does it as Southeast Asia as a whole. So we can't carve out Japan, but we can't carve out I, I think they may be either the oldest or amongst the oldest uh, nations. Again, we're at 38, they're at 48, and Africa's at 19. Um, other, other conspiracy theories, although they're not really conspiracy theories, which is I would reckon that the average African is fitter, has less body fat than the average American let's say. So this is to back up your theory. I would imagine, you know, you hit the mall out here in uh, in Gardena, you'll see a lot of heavy loads walking up and down that. I assume you go to the market in Africa, you do not see as many wide loads as we see out here. Um, so there is a body mass index equation. Then there's the age equation, 
which both things the news didn't see fit to cover here. They didn't seem to want to talk about uh, your fitness, and they didn't seem to want to talk about the age either. But those are two pretty good arguments as to why this place, because this is Africa. They do not have all the technology and all the resources and all the money and all the lucite and all the masks and all the everything that a lot of other developed nations have. So you could argue that they were at a deficit, yet they're doing so much better than we are. And I th- the third, and this is where it really gets into the um, theory that uh, the news was uh, covering this up, is uh, hydroxychloroquine. They're on it there. It's sold over the counter, and they're on it routinely. A large population is on it routinely for malaria, as a prophylactic for malaria. So you have this large group of people that take hydroxychloroquine just as a daily measure because of uh because of the disease. Malaria. Malaria. That's interesting. Right. I didn't I didn't I knew it was a malaria drug or that's what its prescription is generally for here. I did not know it's taken as a prophylactic. What's fascinating to me though is and I keep coming back to this and hit me if you've heard this a million times. We knew early on. I mean, the first kind of red alert was that Washington, uh, state of Washington assisted living center when uh, the virus ravaged that place. And that was kind of the canary in the coal mine, if you will. Um, Only later on did we, through various kinds of tests and um, uh, kind of retrospective uh, autopsies and Things Did we uh, find out that maybe it was in Santa Clara, maybe it was in San Francisco, Los Angeles, things like that. But we knew in real time that it was ravaging an assisted living uh, facility in the state of Washington. We knew, as I sit here in New York, that that order by the governor um, had exacerbated the measure here in the state of New York, the order that nursing homes could not um, uh, refuse people who tested positive. So we knew that was a real issue, um, yet we did not shut down a congregate, stranger, assisted living um, dining, in, uh, in-house dining. We let that go on. That was the last uh, place, I think, in November or October that they finally realized after two waves that that, was a, uh, that apparently was not a good idea. They also, there is um, the, what is astonishing to me, and I will keep saying it because I don't think people understand quite how the Constitution has been suspended and is in a state of suspended animation right now. We have, we have basically instituted a suspension of the writ of habeas corpus in California, which means you don't have a right to a speedy trial. We haven't done that or contemplated doing that since after 9-11 and before that, basically since the Civil War. Um, That is what separates, you know, my father used to say when I'd say, why don't you ever want to go to Mexico for vacation? He always used to say, because I don't want to go to a place that doesn't have the writ of habeas corpus, because that's what is kind of the foundation of a democratic society is that you just can't, like Russia, speaking of Russia, throw the opposition into custody after a show trial or let them languish with no uh, trial. I mean, that was, remember, you don't have to have a, um, uh, be around for a long time. We used to talk about apartheid that way way in South Africa, speaking of Africa, that I didn't have a robust writ of habeas corpus that people could just languish in jail for years and years without any kind of speedy trial rights. Well, we're there now in California. We've had the delegation of the emergency powers to various unelected people, uh, including um, uh, supposed public health people, and to the chief justice who is now um, deemed the suspension of speedy trial to have gone on uh, for basically a year. And also, you have 
put in a situation where there's a Hobson's choice of defense lawyers. Does a defense lawyer insist on a speedy trial, have it denied, um, expose themselves the, as a frontline worker uh, to uh, having to deal with people who may be in custody or in the jail, which is the other hotbed of Corona, or not? And and what have we done about that? I, I, you know, it makes, you know, the, our fearless leader, Governor Gavin Newsom, instead of dealing with pre-trial un, non-convicted people and, and solving that problem, he decided to free up the post-conviction people who were sentenced in prison. That was his, that was his role. You've already been convicted. You're in prison. We'll release you. But people who have not been convicted, who are still presumed innocent, will just suspend your speedy trial rights. Isn't that a wonderful while kind they're of a incar- solution? While they're incarcerated? Yeah. Oh, God. That sounds insane. Yeah, that's, that, that is where we have got to. And when you bring this up, people just, they, they glaze over. They don't care. All they want to do is talk, talk in bromides and platitudes. It's really an astonishing thing. You keep calling them sheep. I, I thought you were being too harsh, but once again, you were early money. You, you called it for what it is. I'm, I, I'm always this Pollyanna as you're the kind of the more sober, you know, observer of the human condition. I keep thinking people would never stand for this. And you keep saying they're sheep. And, you know, there's almost, it's almost, I hate to, I hate to come along and say it, but it's almost like we've been, there's a mass an anesthesia or something. The people have just decided that they're just going to kind of roll over and play dead. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, it's kind of boiling the frog, you know, by just putting them in the tap water and then just constantly turning the heat up. But uh, it is, it's astounding what we will take and what we will do and what we will let have done to us. I think a lot of it is cognitive dissonance and a lot of it is just uh, pure vanity and ego. Because at the beginning of this thing, there was a sort of a two camps. There was a camp that me, you, and Dr. Drew were in. And then there was a camp that others who shall go nameless, uh, some of whom I live with, uh, were in that said, <laughs> this is doom and gloom. And this is the worst thing that ever happened to this country. And so we had two camps and I was, and you were, and Drew and and others were in the camp that said, uh, okay, uh, it's something, but it's not everything. It's just something. Uh, This notion of like, oh, you're a COVID denier. Who the fuck is a COVID denier? No one's a COVID denier. What we're saying is, is it's something. And to me and you and Mike August and Dr. Drew, it was something. To Gavin Newsom and Barbara Ferrer and and many others at at CNN, it was everything. And so my thing was is, look, uh, I got a lot of room for some things on my platter. There's something that has to do with all facets of life. You have a business part of your life. You have a weekend part of your life. You have a social part. There's a health part. There's a time to have a drink and there's a time to hit the gym. I'm just going to weave this in as one of the many somethings that's in front of me. But everyone said, no, no, you have to make it everything. And I said, well, I don't want to make it everything because I got a bunch of other somethings like going out and doing live dates, like coming into work, like going on walks on a horse path in my neighborhood. These are all other some things that I would like to engage in. But they said, no, you make it everything. And if it's not everything, then you're a bad person. And I said, fuck you, you're wrong. And then we went our separate ways. Well, now we're coming back together. And as it turns out, the everything people were wrong. They didn't need to close down the schools. They didn't need to close down outdoor dining. They didn't need to close down Disneyland. They didn't need to close down the gyms. They didn't need to close down the beaches. So the everything people were wrong. But guess who doesn't want to admit they were wrong? The everything people. So now they're just going to will this into them being right. 
Hey, well, hey, schools aren't open yet. Guess who was right? Well, uh, uh, indoor dining's not open yet. Guess who was right? In e- Indoor uh, eating um, gyms aren't open. Guess who was right? That doesn't make you right. That makes you a fucking retard because now you're riding this dead horse into the sunset and you're never going to change. Get off it and go another direction. And by the way, I will accept my apology in uh, the form of a bottle of Don Julio from all the everything people. You guys will be everything. Made it everything. Just, and, yes. Right. And I, this is what, why can't, why can't somebody, why does it become ideology as opposed to, and, and maybe demagoguery as opposed to just analysis? Why can't somebody say, okay, we made mistakes. We're going to course correct. You know, I let's do a retrospective here. We were told Christmas and New Year's was going to be a disaster two to three weeks after. Do you remember this? Sure. In real time? We, I mean, I can send you article after article, uh, uh, place after place. This was going to be the, wait until you see the surge upon surge upon surge. Okay. Guess what happened? January 11th, which is two weeks, less than two weeks after New Year's, almost precisely two weeks after Christmas, it wasn't a surge. It was a drop off the table. Right. A drop off the table. And by the way, a drop off the table in places that were shut down where we quarantined the healthy, something America has never done. We quarantined the healthy. Mind you, our... In jurisprudence, they found it unconstitutional to do it, to to take a 12-block area um, and quarantine a whole 12-block area when there was an outbreak historically. But now we're quarantining an entire state. And these people who want to talk about their rights and their and this or that just go willingly along. Um, in this kind of parade of horribles panic. And it's really astonishing to me at, at, at how they just buy into it. And when you try to have a discussion and ask, how does this help? How did this, how did we solve this problem or compare this particular remedy that we use here and, and explain to me how that helped? Nobody wants to engage. They don't want to engage. Well, let's not forget about the huge spike that was supposed to hit after the Super Bowl. I just saw a clip from a month ago with the CNN reporter standing in Tampa with people in the street partying and drinking. And she was going, what are the police going to do about this? That's nice, CNN reporter. You would like the police to come in and start arresting citizens. When this drops, we'll be three weeks removed, right? Two or three weeks remote from the and Super Bowl. Once again, yeah. And by the way, once again, and nobody follows up on it. They won't say there is no data to support none. There, they can't produce any data that supports any of these urban legends or urban myths. What has happened is that so far, for the most part, unless you get to the U.S. Supreme Court, where there's still some people who understand what the Constitution means, and I never thought I would be the one, never in a million years, did I think I would be the one who was saying that you've got five voices on the Supreme Court who finally understand that the Constitution doesn't take a sabbatical during a health crisis. Um, Unless you get there, the the uh, people and judges are just willing to say that's it. You know, there's we've got deaths. We have uh, that's it. We surrender the Constitution. You know, there's a couple of other things that you had mentioned last week that I wanted to kind of talk about. One mm-hmm. is the current state of um, Donald J. Trump. Mm-hmm. Then the other is Derek Chauvin. Which uh, which do you want to talk about first? Because there's stuff going on in both. I'm curious about Chauvin. Okay, so you had mentioned, I did a a little um, investigation. Trial is still set for March 8th, so we're coming uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Prosecutors are seeking third-degree murder charges against the other three cops in relation to his death. And the Minnesota Court of Appeals is 
if you can believe this, is to hear oral arguments to reinstate the third degree murder for Chauvin on March 1st, ahead of the trial date. And depending on how they rule, that could lead to a delay. Now, the, the last one, I read something, and if true, you know, most federal grand jury proceedings are governed by Rule 60 so that they are um, confidential, highly confidential, and the prosecutors and the law enforcement are not supposed to talk about it. But there has been some reporting that the feds have been investigating Chauvin and that they are waiting, the speculation at least is, that they're waiting on the sidelines to see what happens with the state case. I also saw some reporting that Chauvin was willing to plead guilty to the state case um, and take 10 years, but wanted some kind of uh, either immunity or assurance that the feds would not, after he pled guilty, come in and indict him. And apparently Bill Barr, when he was still attorney general, did not go along with that. That's if you believe the reporting on this subject, which is I, my analysis, if any of this is true, is that they have kind of a Rodney King strategy, mainly if they think that the cops are going to get acquitted, whether it's Chauvin or the other three, that the feds are ready to instantly indict federally so that nobody would, um, uh, would, that it would be a prophylactic, so to speak. But the interesting thing to me is that if it's true that Bill Barr had rejected a plea deal where Chauvin would have gone to prison for 10 years, at least on the state side. Um, third degree murder for Chauvin and the other three officers? And the other three officers. Why are they all being charged with the same thing? Well, I think what they're trying to do, I'll have to get, maybe I'll have this for next week in advance of the arguments. I'll get the uh, briefs. But my guess is that they're trying to um, uh, use uh, the fact that they were acting in concert or in a conspiracy, and that would elevate it, and that the other three officers, by um, not stopping it or interceding, um, are liable. It's interesting because I just saw this week that the governor of Illinois um, signed a, uh, a criminal justice reform um, bill that now at least arguably obligates cops to not allow or to stand by while another cop may be violating um, somebody's constitutional rights, which is an interesting, from our standpoint, as somebody who does a lot of these police brutality cases, that's always been the, the, the big um, um, complaint that I have is that the other cops tend to fall into line a lot of times. You know, you've heard them talk about the thin blue line, but they get together, the stories are synthesized, if you will, or uh, there is a certain kind of camaraderie amongst the cops. I suppose, and I would have to get into it, and I will I'll take a look at what the prosecution and the defense has argued, but I'm guessing that there's either an aiding and abetting or a conspiracy theory. Why not go for more, if not to go less with the other three, then why not go more with Chauvin? I, it, I think anybody you show that tape to, if you said all four of these guys are being charged with the same crime, but one of them was the guy who had the knee on the neck for eight and a half minutes and the other two were, you know, three or whatever were rookies who were facing the other way half the time. I mean, it, it, it defies logic to me. Well, I, and I think they've got, there's a real problem here. Well, I won't call it a problem, but there's a decision the prosecution's going to have to make. Are they going to say that Chauvin had animus or malice towards George Floyd because of the prior relationship? If they do that, that opens the door to anything that Chauvin wants to say about what he knew about George Floyd, right. which will taint that. If they say no, he, they didn't have this prior relationship, the prosecution says that, then um, Chauvin, if he testifies, and generally cops will testify when charged, um, then he may be able to open it up. And then the prosecution may file 
what's called a motion in limine to exclude his ability to talk about those prior acts or the prior relationships. So there's going to be a battle, um, an evidentiary battle, as to whether or not the judge lets this in. And it could come from either the prosecution or the defense. But to your point, the other cops, if they get on the stand, especially the ones who have only been on the force for a couple of weeks, they may take the position, look, I didn't know this guy. I didn't know their history. I'm facing this direction. I see a crowd forming. I am concerned with officer safety. That's what my concern was. This is the officer who's senior on the scene. I'm letting him do his thing. I'm subservient, basically. How is it possible that you could try this case without the information that these two had a prior relationship coming in to the court record. I don't see how that's possible. Because, you know, one of the great things about being a prosecutor is the ability to have ethical dexterity, for lack of a better term, when it comes to seeking the truth. The the prosecutor will say, we want to focus like a laser on just this incident itself. We don't want to go and uh, sully the victim's reputation. Well, excuse me, if that is the truth, then you the, the defendant has a right to bring that forward. Um, but the prosecution will argue, no, that's victim shaming, blah, blah, blah. From the defendant's standpoint, if the prosecution is going to do it, they're going to make a similar type argument. But uh, always, except for celebrities who are famous and cops, um, they get a presumption of innocence. Nobody else does. Everybody else gets a presumption of guilt. All right, let me hit my uh, last spot here. Geico, do you own, do you rent your home? Well, you do one or the other. You want to get your bundle going? Well, how about you bundle it up with your automotive policy? Geico makes it easy to bundle. It's a good thing, too, because you got so much to do already. So you go to geico.com, you get a quote, you see just how much you could save. When you get your bundle going, so get the homeowners, get the renter's insurance, one or the other, and get the uh, automotive and put it all together and bundle at Geico. All right, let's pick up uh, Trump and his trials, pardon the pun, and uh, tribulations uh, next week's show, Mark. Okay. Uh, But we'll probably know more about uh, what's going on. We will. We will know more. We'll know more next week on, on Trump. There's quite a bit going on, and we'll talk about it. His deposition in the E.J. Uh, Carroll, the fact the Supreme Court said Manhattan DA gets eight years out of Mazur, mm-hmm. who's the accountant. I mean, there's quite a bit there to plow through. Uh, tonight, I'll be in Oklahoma City at Bricktown Comedy Club, and uh, Saturday night, too. We'll do live pods, and then we will uh, go ahead and do... Uh, Stand up after that. Just go to AdamCarolla.com because I'm coming to Reno and West L.A. and uh, Illinois and Royal Oak, Michigan, Kansas City. So just do that. Uh, Again, go to AdamCarolla.com and uh, you can check out the YouTube, all the stand up on the YouTube page, YouTube.com slash AdamCarolla. What do you got, Mark? Well, we've got Engine Company 28. We're back open outdoors. Come downtown to Tenny, Mediterranean Tapas, downtown, uh, also outdoors uh, and if you go to the Palm Springs GDs uh, for brunch this Sunday, uh, mention Reasonable Doubt and you'll get a special uh, little treat. If you're in New York, stop by Prova and Grand Central Terminal or at the Moxie Hotel in Times Square. So, till next time, Adam Crow for Mark Garriga saying mahalo. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all new episode.